time I'm fading fast I just wanna make it last Try to let go of the past I close my eyes, embrace the blast Sleepless nights and headaches stack Restlessness to hell and back What's my purpose, what do I grab? A slippery surface, a heart attack Hello and welcome back to Pod Save the Queen. I'm your host Anne Gripper and I am in Kensington Park with our style director Amber Grafland. Hello. We've come for an early morning trip to Kensington Palace for a bit of a behind the scenes tour of their current exhibition about Princess Diana. So we've just walked up from Kensington High Street past Mahiki. The joggers are out. The joggers are out. We've worked out why exactly Mahiki is the favourite nightclub of the Royals because <laughs> it is right on their doorstep. Yeah. Um, the sun is just coming up and it's, it's lovely and we are going to go um, talk and see the clothes of, well, the woman who during her life was basically the most famous woman in the world. Yeah. And to put it into context, I think what's so interesting is when I look back at my early career, I spent pretty much a decade writing about Diana because we didn't have reality TV. The celebrity world was much smaller. If you were writing about a famous person, they were either in a Hollywood movie or they were in a band or they were a supermodel. They were Naomi Campbell or Christy Turlington. And of course, the biggest icon of all was Diana. So for 10 years, pretty much, the media was completely obsessed with her. And of course, fashion played such a big role in her life. And is it surprising that she became such a fashion icon from her sort of early, very innocent days when she kind of first appeared? Well, that's, I think, is what's so interesting. And that's why everyone fell in love with her because there was absolutely no indication of that. If you remember that early photo before, when everybody realized that her and Charles were a thing, and that her wedding might be imminent, the picture of her with the see-through skirt when she's holding the hands of the nursery children. I mean, to think of her then to what she became is pretty much unthinkable. We all kind of, we went on that journey with her. And that's, I think, what this exhibition is all about. Definitely. We're going to see some extraordinary things and uh, we will do our best to describe them and bring you the, the tales from the curator who can give us some real insight into the stories behind yeah. them. So let's go meet Isabella. We are, we've made it into Kensington Palace and joined our lovely curator who's going to give us a, a guided tour, so Isabella Carasso. Thank you very much for showing well, us around. Thank you, thank you for coming. I know it's my pleasure to be able to share some of the stories of Kensington Palace. How long have you. you been working with the palace? Um, goodness, it feels a long time, but actually about five years. Okay. So yeah, not too, too long, considering there's some curators that have been here for, you know, 30 years, wow. I think five, it's not too bad. <laughs> so we're in Stonehall, and as soon as you, it's kind of the instant place where you come in if you're going into Kensington Palace as a visitor to have a look around, and you're greeted immediately by a, an enormous picture of, of Princess Diana, one of the famous Mario Testino shots, and it just kind of yes. sets, sets her relationship with the palace. Well, exactly. So when you come to the Stonehall, um, what we have here is the key characters of the palace. So the palace is over 300 years old. That means we have a lot of stories to tell, yeah. a lot of characters. And of course, Diana, Princess of Wales, she was an important character um, for the history of the palace. She was a, um, a resident here. So she moved to Kensington after she got married to the Prince of Wales. And this is where she grew her family. So, you know, with the princes, this was their home. And for our visitors and for us, it's a very special part of Kensington history to be able to say, you know, this is where this very young family um, grew up together and form, you know, their relationships and everything, so yes. And the exhibition that's currently running at the moment, Diana, mm -hmm. Her Fashion Story, coming, yes. to, coming to a finish quite soon, so do yes. come down and see it very quickly if you can, but what is the, what's kind of the aim behind that exhibition? Yes, so we did Diana, Her Fashion Story because 2017 was the anniversary, the 20th anniversary of her untimely death. And being such an important resident and character of Kensington Palace, you know, we still today have visitors coming in because of her. Um, they, they, she's such a draw to us. So with that important date, we felt we needed to do something. And we wanted to celebrate her life. So rather than shedding light on that very tragic moment, we actually wanted to talk about how, um, how her legacy is still being carried on today by her children. And, you know, we start thinking, so how can we do that? How can we celebrate her life in her former home, you know, in this very special moment in time, but in a way that we really can celebrate her? 
you know, like really, really think about her and everything. She works so hard. So how did she do that? And immediately we understood that fashion was the best way to do that. Um, she really understood the language of clothes. Yes. She was so successful in, you know, conveying those messages, very important messages, via her clothes, via her image. And we felt, well, you know, if there is a better way to do it, you know, we have to do this. Um, so this is how it came about. Um, Diana, her fashion story. Brilliant. Let's, let's go yes. see it. So... We are, okay, so I will give you the names of the places as we walk along, because okay. everything here has such great names. So right now, we're in the Princess Court Arcade. Wow. So and it's, it's grand. It's an arched corridor. It's yes. Nice little lanterns on the walls. Exactly. And then here again, Princess Court Arcade, and you can see a little timeline of the um, monarchs that have some sort of relationship with Kensington, embroidered in cushions. Oh, they're great. Beautiful. <laughs> William, yeah. William and Kate just on the end there. Yeah. Kate and her wedding finery. <laughs> now, going up the stairs. So how long would it take to put an exhibition like this together? Um, with the research and the planning and well we actually put it together quite quickly considering the scale and the subject matter and everything so we start planning two years prior to the opening of the exhibition but it, it came out very fast in fact it was really really fast sometimes i'm still amazed that we we managed so we've moved through a room with a few pictures of yes. the current residents of Yes, yeah, so this so. is what we call the garden room, and we call it the garden room because it used to be the room next to the garden for um, Queen Anne and Queen Mary when a long, long, long time ago in the 17th and 18th century. So now in this room, we try to, because Kensington, as I was saying, it's um, the home for so many young families. Um, Queen Victoria was born here and grew up here. You know, this was, has always been a very homely family palace in comparison to the other ones. Um, so we wanted to show in this room all the 20th and 21st century families that made Kensington their home. So we have, um, starting with Princess Margaret and her two children, and then, of course, Diana, Princess of Wales and the boys. And then the boys grew up, <laughs> and they have their own wall now. So we have um, William and Kate with... Um, well, that is now a little bit old, this photograph. We're waiting for them to release a new photo for us. Um, but this is with George and, Char and Charlotte. And then, of course, we have um, Prince Harry and Meghan when they announced their engagement here. And now I can just see a glimpse through yes. the doorway of some of Diana's fabulous dresses. So we're yes. moving into the Piggott Galleries. And Shall we go? Shall we go? So yes. we've got... A number of different portraits. These must cover the whole sort of period of her, her sort of life in the public eye. I guess. Yes, exactly. So we start with um, an image taken during her honeymoon in Balmoral, and it goes through um, chronologically until a photo taken um, at the auction in 1997 when she sold 79 of her most iconic dresses and we'll talk a little bit more about this auction as we go along she was very consistent in her hairstyling she I was think. yeah she was i mean that's something very important about the princess is that once she understood what worked she stick to it yeah. you know and that is such an important character and we're going to talk a little bit more as we go along as well but yes as you can see she was very consistent whatever worked why change so, evening, evening gowns. Yes. Think we can see a fabulous turquoise green number, mm. a cream number, and two kind of pink numbers, and then another green one hiding behind in a fabulous glass cabinet, which is, um, you know, reminds us very much of that day out at Windsor that yeah. we had in October when we oh, saw yeah. Megan's dress oh, yes. resplendent behind the glass. But, you know, having those grand cabinets does show them off beautifully. And it's secure. I mean, it's, you know, such a nerdy thing to say, but... We need them also because it protects. I, I will share with you. I think it's now the exhibition, you know, is in its very, very final day. So now we have a lot of stories to tell about the exhibition itself. And, I mean, you know, I cannot tell you how uh, moved so many people were to be able to now see those dresses so close. 
And sometimes in the morning we would arrive and there were kiss marks on the cases oh. because that's how, you know, how important and how um, kind of connected people felt. So it's good that we have the glass, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you need the glass. Yeah, it is interesting you make that point and that's how I feel. I think people really did feel like they had a connection to her yes. and that they knew her because we watched her for such a long period of time. Exactly. And yeah, I think we felt that we had a relationship with her. Yes, way. yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Mm. So let's, let's dive in. So what's the, what are the stories behind these dresses? Yes. Or they, is, are they from a, a broad range of time? Or what, what story um, are we telling here? Yes, so we wanted to do the exhibition a little bit chronologically and a lot them thematically. So that means we, each room has its own little story. We're shedding light in a different aspect of the princess's life. But at the same time, we wanted to keep a little bit of a cohesion within chronology. So here are mostly very early on um, dresses. And what we talk about in this room, as you can feel, is very feminine. It's very delicate. Um, very 80s. Very 80s, <laughs> incredibly yeah. 80s. Yes, but the idea here is to say, well, she came into the spotlight very young. Um, when she got engaged, she was, goodness, a child, really. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking of myself when I was 18. What was I doing? You know, like, <laughs> she was, so she was really, really young. And she came from an aristocratic background. So um, as many, you know, aristocratic girls from the 1760s and 70s, she grew up very protected um, in this kind of family bubble almost, you know, in the, in the state of her parents. And she, she didn't really have much relationship with clothes, the way that she developed later on in her life. So the story goes that when she got engaged, actually she only um, owned her own clothes, only four pieces of clothes. Everything else came borrowed from friends, from her sisters. Both so that's her... just incredible to me. Isn't you know, it? I think the... the, the... The kind of fast track journey that she yes. had to go on. I mean, it was obviously something that was instinctively in her, though, because yes. to go from that to the icon that she became, it obviously did come naturally oh, to her. Yes. She did have an innate sense of style, and as you say, what suited her, and she yes. knew. Oh, absolutely. And she had to learn really fast, but then again, she had help. You know, she created a very good relationship with the designers. Yeah. Um, she had. Very early on, Anna Harvey at Vogue, you know, kind of creating those connections with the designers. But with all that help, you still have to have something in you. Definitely. To, to, to spark that. Because if you're not interested in clothes at all, you know, it's, it's, it's a job then. It's a, it's a big work to get that. So obviously she had that flair, that something inside her. Yeah. But it's, it's very interesting because when she comes to the public eye, um, all of a sudden she has to create this vast, you know, working wardrobe. So she goes from being in the countryside and then, you know, here in London she had her own little world. And all of a sudden she's traveling the world and doing all those different engagements. So going from banquets to um, hospital visits and every single occasion um, required a different outfit. And she has to build this really, really, really fast. So what we see is that very early on in the 80s, um, she still have a very kind of feminine um, style, lots of frills, everything is very girly, yes. um, pastel colors, you know, everything. It's, it's, it's very princessy in, in the way we think about clothes. Um, yes, and you can see here all the colors. It's almost like candy-like, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and big, and she obviously had the help of the designers, as I said, but she always came with that idea that, oh, I like lace, I like frills, I like volumes, um, and as we're going to see, we progress, that changed ever so slightly. I would just mention one more thing in this room. This um, decoration on the wall, do you have an idea what it comes from, where we got mm. the inspiration for this pattern? Wedding dress? Yes. Oh, well done. Oh, I mean, you're really the first your one that ever <laughs> got it right. Yeah. So it's actually inspired by the lace in her wedding dress. 
So we took out the roses um, there in the lace and we abstracted that and created this pattern. So it gives, again, that idea of very feminine, very um, delicate. Um, so yes. Okay. So, I mean, this is a great place to start. I mean, I don't know. I think out of these, the, mm. the white number, I would be yes. quite happy. It's a kind of a one-shoulder yes. draped. I'd like to wear that one. Okay, yes. The, 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 oh, I love this. We're looking at the Victor Edelston dress. It's kind of off the shoulder. What, what, means, what would you describe that? It's turquoise. Um, you, I mean, it's some sort of jeweled green. Yes, jeweled you, green. We can say turquoise. We can say... Aquamarine? No, maybe not aquamarine, but it, it's, it's very fitted around the around the top half with the buttons down yes. the front. And then, how do we describe this? It kind of goes it's out kind of like a this. weird bustle, like a yeah. big yeah, it's like a big scarf wrapped around your belt. Very, very good. So basically, what happened is this is the first dress that Victor Edelstein did for the princess, and she commissioned this in 1986, um, so she could wear it for an official portrait. So it. Victor felt the pressure there, I can tell you. <laughs> by 86, she was very famous, you know, incredibly famous by this point. Um, and he was for an official portrait. So he says, actually, with this dress, he really felt the pressure. And then later on, he becomes more comfortable with the idea. But this one was, for him, a big step. And so you can see it's very much inspired by historic dress, so you see the very, very wasted top, very fitted, um, incredible craftsmanship that goes on inside this dress yeah. to hold it in place. And then the skirt, as you said, it, it reminiscence of the bustle. So late 19th century when women had, you know, the very kind of straight front and a lot of volume in the skirt and it's draped, again, um, emulating and this kind of historic impact to the portrait, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yes. And I mean, you see the portrait. It's incredible. Um, and, and you feel it's regal. You know, it's, it's something that can last generations and be part of a lineage. Oh. And as you say, mm. the, the press dubbed it princess style. Oh, yes. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it couldn't be more princess. It couldn't be more princess. No. Okay, well, let's see what delights you have for us next. Yes. Oof. So this one, it seems less formal so the, the other turquoise yes. in, the, in the corner so actually this is a day dress um, so from everything in this case we have six dresses six, one, two, three, four, five, five. we used to have six um, so we have five dresses all of them are um, evening wear except for this one and this is the dress the day dress that she wore for her state official tour of New Zealand in 1983 and this there's a very iconic photograph of her um, greeting um, um, a chief from the um, oh goodness my Mary Mary um, so I never say how, never know how to, <laughs> to pronounce that um, but she is greeting a chief Mary and you know she's doing their way of greeting, greeting which is yeah, yeah. just touching noses yeah. Um, and she was wearing that. So if you know the photograph, you know the dress. See, I remember this dress, but I always thought it was a really pale blue. Yes. It's completely different when you see it, in a, you know. And it's Catherine Walker. Yeah. And it's Catherine Walker. Who obviously now um, Kate wears. Yes. Yes, actually, it's true. And Catherine, as we're going to see along, I keep saying this, I mean, we should do it. Um, Catherine was a very important player in the whole evolution of Diana's style. Absolutely. She was such an important figure, especially for what um, what we understand as Princess Diana's style in the 90s. You know, very sleek, um, very fitted, kind of minimal. That's Catherine. Okay. Korean. So, yeah, we'll, we'll so see she kind more. of evolved from this, this 80s kind of bit more... Oh, yes. Um, how do we say it? Large. Frou frou. Frou frou. Okay, <laughs> yes. Over the top. Yeah, but it was, no, it this was, was the fashion of the time. It was. Statement, yeah. Statement. Sp statement. Okay. okay. <laughs> no, this is I like that. But yeah, so as you can see, she starts on with her style being very frilly. Ve very lots of, feminine. Oh, very feminine. And lots of lace and um, pie crust um, necklines, you know, all the kind of contrasting cuffs and, and um, collars very pastel -y. so 
it's going to change. Yeah, and we're going to see this change. change. So before we see too much change, I want to make a pit stop here in this very little room. I love watching, seeing the designs that the designers have done for the outfits that we, yes. then, that we then see afterwards. Like the, the stylized way that they draw, there's something really beautiful about them. I mean, you, yeah. you, might, you might be like totally over them because you see no, them. No, no, I love seeing just, them, I really do. But um, it's just the different, it's, it's art. It's art. It's the, you know, the first stage of the art that then becomes incredible yes. dresses. Well, and, and the thing for us is that when we started doing the research, um, we just didn't want to talk about the princess and her style just via looking at photographs. I mean, everybody has done that. You know, every newspaper and magazine would have been doing that, and they did for that particular date. So what could we do that was different? And we felt that because Anna created such a bond with the designers that she worked, and most of them are still here, they're still working, yeah. you know, they have incredible memories... Um, we actually wanted to create the exhibition through their eyes, through their stories, because those were the people that actually knew her, yeah. you know, intimately. So we start going around and interviewing all the designers and asking for um, anything that they had that could help us tell the story of her, the evolution of her style. And it's incredible the amount of things that they had to say. Many memories were very similar, so they always remember the princess being very approachable, incredibly approachable, actually. Um, when she had to create a whole wardrobe, she would invite them to Kensington Palace, to her apartment, and they would sit on the floor. You know, she would sit with incredible. them and go through swatches of fabrics and discuss everything, and she was so in tuned. Um, she read everything that came out in the press about herself. So not because she was vain, uh, but because she wanted to understand what people were getting out. And she knew how important it was. Well, exactly. Because people were watching her and it was about her image and how she portrayed exactly. herself. Exactly. And when we started doing the research, what it became very apparent, and this is something that I never really clicked you know, before, is that 90% of what we know about the princess came from still photographs. There's actually very few footages of her speaking. Yeah. Everything comes from images. So she knew how important it was um, to, to have an appearance or an image that conveyed the messages that people weren't listening necessarily from, you know, her speech. Yes. So every, she would read everything and she would be like with the designer. So what messages will we convey if I wear this dress? Or what will people get out if I wear this outfit? And she would read everything to compare from the message that she intended to what people actually got. And this was an important way to learn. And so the designers, they're telling us all this, and we're thinking, I mean, there's such an important part of the research. We need to do something just for them, you know, almost like an homage for them. And I mean, these feel like a kind of real insight to kind of behind the scenes of what would yes. have been going on. Oh, yeah. absolutely. And if you see here this um, uh, Bevel Sassoon sketch and you have a very stylized Diana <laughs> in a floral dress and then we have a little swatch of the fabric and right at the top you have handwritten the word Please, and that's actually hers. Right. So, said, yes, please, I want this one. Yes, this <laughs> one, that's the one that I want. Please, yes. Um, and what they would do, so they would come to Kensington Palace and they would sit on the floor and discuss whatever she was doing, if it was a tour to, goodness, Brazil, or if it was a visit to a hospital. She would tell them, give the brief, you know, they would discuss. And then the designers would go back to their studios and work and do like tons and tons and tons of sketches and ideas based on what they discussed. And then they would send her those sketches and she would go through them and say, yes, I like this or this I like, but I prefer with that fabric. And, but this one was a hit, apparently. And I love this leggy 1988 Amazing. Yeah, it's amazing blue floral mini dress with matching yes. hat it is incredible I don't well, know. it's a great holiday outfit sling back shoe I know great yeah. Yeah. and I have a great story about this so this outfit actually got done got made but not the hat she ditched the hat because no listen Covered to too this. much of her face no it's because this was worn for a visit at um, children's hospital 
And she felt, felt that she much. couldn't hug a child with a hat, a big hat. A child cannot come close to you. How interesting. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like a fun, bright thing to oh, wear yes. for a children's hospital visit. Exactly. So, so the primary so well. colors and the big prints. And this is something that she would do when she would go to visit children's hospitals. Um, she always would wear chunky jewelry so they could play with. And she would have very crazy colors, very, you know, like primary colors because they would feel attracted. Make her approachable. And yeah. then, exactly, and then not have gloves or hats because then she could hug them. I mean, really. Yeah. The lady had a plan. So you talked about the messages that she was trying to convey, that yes. the, the designers were talking about. Like, what kind of, what were the key messages that she was trying to convey through her clothes? I think it depends on the event. So if she was going, say, for a children's hospital, she wanted to approach that message of... Um, I'm warm, I'm caring, um, motherly figure, I'm here because I care for you. You know, let's, let's play together, let's be happy. That was kind of the idea. If she was going to, say, um, visit HIV patients, and that was a charity that she really supported, she wouldn't wear gloves because there was a lot of stigma still around the disease. And, you know, people were like, oh, can you touch? It's contagious. Oh, my God. You know, there was such a stigma around it. And she was like, in order for us to, you know, find the, the cure, we need to know how to deal with the disease right now. So she goes to the hospital, and there's a very famous um, image of her taking her gloves off before she shaking her. to show there was no fear. Exactly. So then, you know, that's the message that she's saying. There's no fear. There are mm. people like me. I'm going to sit with them. I'm going to talk. We're going to have a moment, you know, world, wake up, you know, yeah. we're all people. So it depended where she was going. Um, but yeah, there was always something. If you look at the images now, there's always something to read. Right. Okay, let's, let's go. Let's go to next, the next room. room. And I think I'm right in saying there's a book of this exhibition. Isn't yes. There? If there are people that can't make it to Absolutely. London because they are our friends in you know in America, there is a book available from yes. Amazon and other places. I think that you yes, can order absolutely. It. So it's a very small publication actually, but it really gets all the good stories that we're telling here, images of most of the dresses. So yes, if they cannot come, um, which is a shame, you know, but. <laughs> It's, it's reality. There you go. Yeah, so Diana has a fashion story, but otherwise, come to Kensington Palace next yes. time you're in London because whatever is going on, there'll be something fabulous to see. <laughs> so we've got a whole case here. So three tartan yes. situations. And um, this one is so famous. I'm sure everybody remembers this image of Diana and Charles when she was wearing the tweed suit. I mean, it's, for me, that's so interesting to see that. Yes. Well, this is um, what she wore for her honeymoon. So... Mm -hmm. Um, as I said, growing, growing up in a state in the countryside of England, she was very familiar and very comfortable with the types of activities that she would do, you know, in that setting. So when they went to spend their honeymoon in Balmoral in Scotland, she knew exactly, you know, that was a very comfortable environment for her. And she knew she was going shooting and riding and everything. So she gets this suit done. And she loves it. She loves it so much that she actually had two jackets made. One, they're almost identical, except that one has a little bit more give on the shoulders. And that is so she could shoot, you know, course, take part yeah. of it. And it's brilliant. But here we have, as you said, three different tartans and three very different stories. The middle one is what she wore for the Brema um, Games in, the, in Scotland. And again, very reminiscent of the Scottish tartan. So, you know, if you go to a place, she usually... And this is not just her. This is something that she learned from the Queen and the Queen Mother and Queen Mary and Queen Victoria before them. You know, this is a, um, a generation of royal women that incorporate cultural and national emblems into their clothing. And which we've continued to see with Kate and Meghan oh, as well. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's so powerful. Why not? You know? know, this dress to me is the perfect example of why it's, it was so much about what she bought to the clothes. Because I yes. think it's hard to imagine anybody looking <laughs> particularly fabulous because it's such, got such a high neckline. Yeah. It's quite fussy. It's very prim. Yes. Actually, you have the picture of her next to it and she makes it look modern. She makes it look fresh. Yes. It looks incredible. But actually, I cannot imagine anybody mm -hmm. else it's doing that to that dress. It's almost like an 1800s sort of headmistress dress. Yeah. <laughs> but she Love looks that. absolutely 
you know, sensational in it. So it was, it was all about what yes. she brought to these clothes. And I think, well, that's a very interesting point because this is what we wanted to say with the exhibition is that you have all those dresses that you recognize and the craftsmanship is amazing in all of them. You know, she was using the best designers of the time. But without her... No, they don't represent this you know, it's, it's, it's less than half the story really well, it's yes, what she it's, she was so important the way she carried the clothes not just the clothes themselves it's how she wore them yeah. um, it makes such a difference so sometimes visitors say oh i didn't imagine the dress was like this and it's because it's missing basically the most important yes. part of it yeah. um but then this one this is great i love this coat because I hate this coat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you said it. <laughs> it's and a turquoise tartan, quite box-shouldered, very yes. 1980s. Yes. And I think it's probably, if it wasn't in an exhibition at Kensington Palace, you might be looking for it on the back of a rail of a charity shop. And where you probably it's... wouldn't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it's... Sorry to the Emmanuels who yes. designed it well, in 1985. Five. Um, I have to say, for me, it's one of the best in the exhibition because everybody hated it like it was so not popular i mean i cannot stress how bad people thought about this um, dress code she wore it for a uh, official visit to italy um, she you can see her wearing it with prince charles in venice and it's so 80s it screams 80s yeah you know um the boxy, the incredibly boxy shoulders and the very wide um, lapel and everything is just so 80s. And for her, it was basically what Vogue was telling her to wear. You know, every woman was seeing this kind of silhouette on the magazines, the fashion magazines at the time. This is what fashionable clothing was in the 80s. And there she goes, she wears it, and the press says, oh, it's a horse blanket, oh, it's, you it know. It doesn't photograph well at it all, does it? The shoulders are so big, I think you just need to get the scale of them. I mean, oh. they kind of make her look twice as wide as she is, maybe three times. And, and for a woman, you know, you compare sitting it next to the, the headmistress dress in the middle, <laughs> which has got such a, a, a figure mm -hmm. to it, so something that is shapeless, well, for want of a better word. Exactly, and this is a switch for her because this is when she realized actually what the public wanted wasn't a trendy style a princess you know a fashionable princess people wanted a stylish princess and there's a big difference between being fashionable and being stylish and this is when it clicked and this is a moment when you see she is abandoning all the frills and all the lacy everything that was so hers in the 80s this is the moment when she realized, actually, they don't photograph that well. No. You know, they, they're not, they don't suit me that well. It's just what magazines are telling me to wear, but maybe they don't know what I want to wear. Maybe they don't know how it works for me. So she kind of takes it back, if you like. Exactly. Her and th exactly. Yeah. And this is such a pivotal moment. And this is when we continue. You're going to see it changes so much. Wow. Wow. <laughs> it's like yes. walking into a totally different exhibition and the light changes. Yes. Well. You, can yeah. feel, you can feel the change. So now we're looking at a black sort of brocade, maybe? Uh, it's a lace, lace, but in three tiers in the skirt. And then a sort of a, is that, is it charcoal and red evening dress or is it? The, 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 the it's a faded black. Faded black, yeah. <laughs> and black velvet. Yes. Almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Full length gown. Oh, I really remember this one. Yes. The black and the red, yes. So they Catherine Walker. Yes, exactly. And you see, it's a completely different aesthetic from before. And in this room, um, as she becomes more comfortable with what worked, what didn't work, um, you know, what she was supposed to be wearing, what worked in the magazines, what didn't, she becomes a little bit more playful with things. She becomes a little bit more comfortable in sometimes breaking the rules. And there's a fantastic quote from her, and it's here back, from, um, back to, the, to the dress, and says, sometimes I can be a little outrageous, which is quite nice, sometimes. <laughs> um, and you can see she starts having a lot of fun with her clothes. And so this room... We're trying to pay homage, as we did with the designers before. Here we're paying homage to the theatre and the ballet and the art because she loved it. She was such a big patroness of the uh, performance 
of performing arts, especially the ballet. She absolutely loved the ballet. She danced when she was younger. She wanted at one point to be a ballerina, of course, at that point. You know, it, it didn't work out the way she wanted, um, but she loved it. She was always going to the to all premieres in London. She absolutely loved the theatre. So here, the background of this case is actually the stage of the Colosseum. Yeah. And all the clothes here, they have some sort of drama. I mean, they, they seem very uh, dark, and they are very dark, but actually this first um, dress, the lace one, it's, to me, is very reminiscent of costumes in La Traviata. Yes. You know, the Spanish kind of layers in the skirt and the very dramatic um, of the shoulder neckline. And for here is the first time she wears costume jewelry. And not many royal women used to wear costume jewelry. I mean, it was all about the big diamonds. And, you know, if you think of the queen with all her tiaras and brooches and things. And Diana is actually having fun with costume jewelry. Well, it's actually the pearls, the long strand. So she's kind of tied a long mm -hmm. choker style. And then it also has the pearls hanging down. That's what makes the outfit. Yes, yeah. well, exactly. You could do a fabulous kind of Paso Doble flamenco situation. Yes, you, you can definitely feel it. And I really remember this, the red and black. So this is a Catherine Walker dress. It was in 1995. She yes. was a good close friend of um, opera singer um, Luciano Pavrotti. Mm -hmm. But look how happy she looks in that photograph. She knows she looks absolutely amazing oh, she in looks that dress. Stunning. Yeah. She looks stunning. And you can see, um, again, we're missing a body. But actually you have this kind of swimmer. Um, cut of yeah. the body so it, you have the very high neck but then the shoulders are quite exposed and this is a feature that she understood work really well having her shoulders emphasis on the shoulders and yes she looks absolutely amazing but I will sh highlight here the belt um, it's inspired by military braiding yes Again, you know, adding a little bit of drama. And this she wore for the first time for V-Day 50th anniversary event. Um, so Luciano Pavarotti, he was doing a concert in, um, at the Royal Albert Hall to raise awareness and money and commemorate this very important date. So she's bringing that date and adding military elements to it. Yeah, it's stunning. And, and it still looks amazing. And it looks like I can imagine how good you would feel wearing it. Oh, yes. Just because, you know, it's yeah. a kind of like dress. shoulders out, high neck. And I, it's weird somehow, you know, the kind of the military is like, yeah, powerful dress. Mm -hmm. right. Absolutely. Good. Okay. Right. So is that, that was Catherine Walker as well. So she was clearly yes. one of the key mm. the key people who were... Absolutely. Well, we have the sparkle in this room. Oh, yes. So this case, so now we're in a very big room you can hear from the echo it's a much much wider room than we were before this was a big moment oh absolutely <laughs> so in this case we have a lot of like oh i remember that it's all about here glamour and we reach the peak of her style okay so this is very late 80s early 90s when her style becomes overtly glamorous so glamorous that in America she was dubbed in the press as Dynasty Die. Dynasty Die, yes. yes. And we're standing in front of the Travolta dress, which exactly. I think is the only way, only way to describe it. Well, exactly. So this is um, a Victor Elderstein. It's midnight blue velvet, very heavy velvet, but it's draped so delic delicately around the body. I mean, to reach, to get those pleats in a velvet, it's hard. I can tell you, this is him showing off his skill. <laughs> He's saying, okay, we're going to just splash now. And look at her. When she danced with John Travolta in the White House, I mean, can you get a most, more iconic moment? It cannot get better than that. And look at the way it moves. So obviously, you've talked about how it works around the body, but then it fl you have the kind of velvet just cascading down on the yeah. bottom, and the bottom of the hem is very free. And, of course, when she hit the dance floor, oh my she's God. doing all the yes. right things. And this is from 34 years ago now. Yes. And I don't know, I can imagine velvet isn't necessarily the easiest of fabrics to, it's not. Um, to make, sort of maintain and keep well. Like how, where are all of these dresses kept when they're not in, in, in glass yes. cases in your exhibition? And how, how do you look after them and make sure they do stay? Well, my cons the conservators here would love you at this moment because <laughs> they are the unsung heroes, you know, of any dress collection. 
So when most of the dresses here, or many of them, are from, come from loans, some from different institutions, so they would care for the dresses the same way as we do in museum standards, and some come from private individuals. And with them, it's very funny because we always have that moment when we first approach the dress and they know how important it is, you know how important it is, and you're thinking, oh, it could be so much better, but how, you know, a normal person that doesn't work in the museum environment, how would you know? So sometimes when we get a loan, say a dress that you own in your wardrobe, although... So I have my, my grandmother very proudly okay. kept, kept the dress that she wore to my parents' wedding, and she was always pestering me to try it on, and I never ever did, but then when we were, we were clearing out her house recently after mm -hmm. she sadly died, but I tried it on, it's like, this actually fits, this is, mm -hmm. this is going to be my queen dress, because it's not, it is, it's, it's green with the buttons and a coat, but it has been next to something with a bit of metal. So it's got a little stain which yes. I need to sort out. So I have not been looking after it well. Well, exactly. So this is sometimes what happens. And then the, the um, dresses come to the exhibition. And by the time we have to give it back, we give back in our standards. So acid-free boxes, acid-free tissues. So never uh, fabric touching fabric. There's always a layer of acid-free tissue in between everything. Straight as much as possible. If you have to fold say, a skirt or um, a, um, a sleeve or whatever, you always put like a, a what we call a sausage of um, tissue. So we roll the tissue in a very particular way and you put wherever it's folding so it doesn't create it's creases tough. and everything. So, you know, there's very special ways to keep it. And we give that back to people and they're like, I'm going to keep it like this forever. <laughs> Interestingly, this is from a private lender. Yes, yeah. it is. So we, we have very good relationships with all our lenders. They are incredibly generous to us and we love them for that. Um, but I mean, somebody gets to wear this. Do people, do people wear the things that they have in that collection? Some have, some don't. The thing is, when most, all those private lenders, they all got those dresses from the auction in 1997. Um, when they got that, some of them were thinking, I'm going to wear a dress that belonged to the princess. It's going to be amazing, yeah. you know. And then she passed away a month later. And all of a sudden, those dresses, they get very different meaning different and meaning, yeah. value. All of a sudden, they become relics. So some people still wore it because that was the purpose, but some people all of a sudden realize, okay. This is a piece of history now. This is yeah. history now. I cannot touch it. I cannot, you know. So it depends. It, it really depends. But I think most of the lenders now, today, um, they really understand it, and most of them keep it in very good conditions. But um, to answer your earlier question, how we keep them, we keep them in rooms that are incredibly secure. I cannot tell you the, the size of the key that I have to carry <laughs> around with me. It never fit my pockets. Um, so it's incredibly secure. And then inside, all the conditions are monitored. So um, temperature. temperature, humidity is very important to keep stable. Um, pests, we're always looking for, you know, moths or things like that, because <gasps> that is the biggest, like, nightmare <laughs> you can possibly. But otherwise, yeah, we keep them all in acid-free boxes and very, very carefully. And how big is the collection that you have yourselves of Diana's yes. private? Well, uh, ooh, that's a good question. Okay. So, Historic Royal Palaces, our dress collection is called the Royal Ceremonial Dress Collection. It's a grand name, it's a grand collection. Um, and we have about 20,000 objects. <gasps> but that spans from our earliest... My heart has just stopped. Oh, good! <laughs> I love that. Wow. So the earliest is um, a hat worn in the court of Harry VIII. That's how old it wow. gets. And then Diana is our kind of most recent object. But I would say right now, how many objects, Diana, we have? I would say over, over 30. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, and that includes um, dresses, suits, um, not many accessories, actually, because that didn't go to the public domain yeah. as such, but I would say about 20 to 30. And are they things that passed directly to the Royal Collection when she died, or are they things that you have subsequently kind of brought well, back into the collection? W because we're separate from the Royal Collection, we're independent charity. Um, whatever goes to them doesn't come to us, which sometimes is sad, but you know, we have our own collection. We're very proud of it. Um, so many of the dresses that we have in the collection came either from auctions, 
so we go actively buy them. Some people donate to us, and that is always very generous, and yeah. we love when we, they do that. Um, some things are passed between um, institutions, um, something that an institution cannot look after anymore for whatever reason. But yeah, everything that is in the rare collection belongs to the rare collection. We are separate, unfortunately, or fortunately. Well, we've been, well, we've been standing here talking. I'm fascinated yeah. by the birds, oh, the sequin yes. birds going up the back of this, I, this cream dress, which, I mean, it's, it looks quite wedding dress like. It quite looks shape wise actually not dissimilar to Megan's no. dress. In terms no, of yes, the, the style of kind floating of floating hemline. Three quarter length sleeves. It Goodness, I like never a, thought about that. It feels mm. like a similar weight of fabric. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, if a bride wore that, it would look entirely like a, a wedding dress, but it's, and it's got a, quite a high neckline, just kind of a small. Yeah. Round neck, most of it. I love birds the down the birds down the chest and birds down the the skirt the with a, with a small of sort Saudi of a, Arabia. a kick yes. train. I think that was really good. I stuff. love this description. I mean, if you want to, you know, come and catalogue with us. I'm <laughs> loving this. Russell's going to be so loving jealous. Loving this. Well done. So this is actually a modesty dress you would never be able to tell it's a modesty dress. So this is one of the dresses that Catherine Walker created for the princess for her um, state visit to Saudi Arabia. And of course, you have to be very respectful of the national costumes um, in Saudi Arabia. They, are very, um, they have very strict rules on what you can and cannot wear. And she was very sensitive to those rules, of course. Um, so here you have a very incredibly beautiful, put together, fashionable dress, very Western, but it had the long sleeves, the very high neckline, um, long, um, the length it's covering your ankles. So it's actually quite respectful. To very high neckline, but then it's been made feminine with the embellishment exactly. and the fact that it's in white and it's, an ivory. Yeah, it, it's, it's, and it's kind of broken up. It's not just like a massive fabric. No, 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 no. It's, it's so well done because you're incorporating some kind of, uh, you know, some limitations that some people would think, oh, what do I wear, you know, in a situation like this. And no, they're making the most out of it. And then the embroidery of the birds that start on the shoulders, go right through the center of the bust, and then swirls around the waist and goes back down all the way to the train. Those are falcons. And falcons are the national emblems of Saudi Arabia. So again, that idea of incorporating the culture you're going to into your dress as a way to be respectful, as a way, a diplomatic kind of element. something that we've seen the younger royals continue oh, to yes, do. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Wow, um, special shout out to Pat Kerr Tigret for lending this one because it yes, was beautiful. fabulous. It's amazing, isn't it? So there's probably too many dresses here for us to talk through all of them. Is yeah. there one here that is your favourite that we've I, missed? I have to say the story of this one in the middle here. I'm glad we're going to this one. And this is... Well, I'm very personally attached to this one because I have to say I'm Brazilian. Okay, so there's that. And this is one of the dresses that she wore to Brazil when she went there in 1991. Now, for our fans, our listeners, there are fans of football. I don't know how many there are out there. But there was a World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> the Brazil didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a big deal, like a, a very big deal for Brazilians. I mean, now we're getting used to losing it. Mm. But, you know, that was a big deal at that time. And we not only lost it, but we lost for our biggest rival, which is Argentina. Ooh, Ooh exactly. Ouch. Exactly. So when the princess went to Brazil, she was very aware, not only, you know, as we were talking about the Saudi Arabia one, you have to think about the costumes, but you also have to think about the culture. You know, what is popular culture? And of course, football in Brazil is a big part of Brazilian's life. And she went, and none of the dresses that she brought with her were either yellow, light blue, or okay. dark blue, because those are the colors of the Brazilian and the Argentinian um, jerseys. Interesting. Yeah. Now, isn't that bright? That's very bright. I remember this dress. It's beautiful. One so it has one completely long full sleeve and then mm -hmm. the other shoulders completely bare um, beautifully embellished with a, a tiny pink and silver sequins yes 
and and on a cream base and it, it it's again it's Catherine Walker mm -hmm. yeah I think she might be winning she really really <laughs> understood her style well yeah. the thing with Catherine is that when the two met it was basically a match made in heaven because this is the moment when the princess really is so comfortable with her position of what I need to wear you know, she knows what is required, she knows how to play a little bit, she knows what works, what doesn't work. And then she comes to Catherine, who has a very, um, a very clear aesthetic. Catherine always had that aesthetic, a very kind of slim, very elegant, you know, not many frills. She was French, I think there's something French in yeah. that, like less is more kind of attitude. And the both got together and it was like brilliant. And another thing about Catherine that really worked in favor of their relationship is that unlike all the designers, Catherine didn't work on um, a calendar, seasonal kind of way of working. So she didn't create collections that had to be showcased in this particular date or you know, for fashion week or this and that. Catherine just worked in her own calendar. Yeah, her so own she just way. focused on being excellent occasion wear. Exactly. Mm. So when she comes, she meets Diana, she is the only one of all the designers that is 24-7 available because she doesn't have to create a certain amount of, you know... Um, no Paris Fashion Week deadline. Exactly. And then you have to have 100 uh, pieces and blah, blah, blah. She, she didn't have that. So she was 24-7 available. And that is crucial and this is how it really really worked interesting okay okay so let's we're almost there almost there so this case here it's a big contrast i mean it couldn't be a more contrast to the case next to it that we were just looking at and this is when the separation happens so she separates from the Prince of Wales before, obviously, um, there's a, a gap between separating and getting divorced. But when she separated, she realized she wasn't going to need most of those dresses anymore. The amount of very, very formal events and occasions that she was going to take part was going to decrease, I mean, exponentially, really. You know, it, so she realized her whole wardrobe had to change rather than having a whole, you know, wall of evening dresses or ball gowns, now she, she really can pare everything down and really focus on the charities and the kind of the causes that she really believes. She has more time now and she really takes that role of, I'm a businesswoman now, you know, I'm, I'm going to work everything that I can in pro of those um, charities, those causes. So you see her, her style really slims down to the bare minimum. And all of a sudden she's a businesswoman. She's wearing suits, right? You have the, the um, jacket and dress suit. She has those very kind of um, slim shifts, very 90s, yes. but also very much about let's focus less about me and more about the causes. And I think at this point, because these, these were clothes that kind of normal women, if you like, mm -hmm, could, mm -hmm, could mm -hmm. wear. I think this is when she had almost more of an influence on the way people oh, yes. dress oh, on a day-to-day -day level. Absolutely. I mean, the pumps, and when she started wearing the chinos, the, yes. the shirts, the glasses, everything, and all the accessories, I think she had a even bigger impact in many ways oh, on the way people, normal women were dressing. Absolutely, because, I mean, all of these amazing grand dresses, yes, they are having an impact in fashion, so she's wearing big shoulders, people want to wear big shoulders, you know, that's that kind of idea, but actually here women can emulate. Even the clothes she wore to the gym. At well, this exactly. Point, were <laughs> and the yeah. jeans, you yeah. know, the mummy jeans yeah. with the boots and everything, like, yes, it, it's all of a sudden she's She's stripping down and being, well, stripping down her style, like the decoration, in order to be very much focused on what she's talking about, the causes. But again, because it's so simple now, women can emulate. And this is when there's a very funny photo um, from this period, 97, and you have, I think, about six or seven women. They all have the same Diana hairstyle, and they're all wearing sunglasses yeah. and the shift, and they all look like Diana. So... <laughs> Yes, now you can look like Diana, <laughs> you know. And, uh, albeit, so this is a, a pair down, we're standing in front mm -hmm. of another Catherine Walker again, actually, so mm -hmm. a, a shift day dress. Did Diana, during her, her, her royal mm -hmm. life, wear much high street 
fashion? Because we see, I mean, we see the young royals today wear a bit of H&M and a bit yeah. of Topshop and a bit of Zara. I think it's because fashion now has changed. You know, in Diana, in the you 80s didn't have that and history. 90s, you didn't have that kind Marks of... expenses. Yeah, I mean, it just it. didn't exist. Yeah. And it wasn't, fa you know, if, today we have H&M and Zara and, I mean, not talking about the political... It's you know, international the side of it. now. You have yes, to, yeah. exactly. But before, to shop, you, where would you go, you know, to, to buy very good clothes that were reach approachable to people like there were no places like she had to go to to i mean everybody catherine walker and belleville sassoon and all those they're like they're not street high Actually, street the closest was probably a ralph lauren chino or yes. sweatshirt or something that she wore later, later in life but yeah so no. the options weren't there no well exactly it's a very different way we think of fashion to, of the past, but with our mentality of today, and we think, oh, you know, it's easy, whatever the rose wear today, we can check and buy online immediately, right? The information is out there immediately. This one, she would wear something, it would be on the papers the next day. So you already have a, a, a time difference. And then you cannot go online, you have to go to the store, and most of the dresses well, were done for made. her. Yeah, yeah, exactly, custom made for her. They're not available. Even if they are, they're, you know, bespo uh, you know, a very different kind of price range and everything. So we can, it's very difficult with our contemporary eyes to say what was the impact then for yeah. fashion, because fashion was different. Mm -hmm. And what, you say it's difficult to say what the impact is, but what do you think her kind of, her fashion legacy is, either in sort of society or for the royal family? Well, I think in my way of viewing this is how she understood clothes more than how many clothes she was able to sell via her image or what styles did she make it more popular to me the most important legacy or contribution that she did for fashion is the way that she understood the power of clothes you know she wasn't just wearing because she had to or because she had to look pretty but it's because there were messages that she could convey. She knew how powerful her image yeah. was. Because yeah. I know it's, it's always something that, you know, people debate whether you should talk about what the Duchess of Cambridge and the Duchess of Sussex are, are wearing and are you just reducing them to being a clothes horse. But actually, as you say, quite often we don't actually get to hear from them. Sometimes they talk mm -hmm. or sometimes you hear from them by what they've said to other people. But the only message they can definitely get mm -hmm. across, unless they're writing on bananas, mm -hmm. is to is what they're wearing. That's the thing that yeah, everyone's going to say. And it, exactly. And I mean, Dan is such a good example for that because, you know, as we talked before, she was one of the most photographed women in the world at that time. And you barely hear her voice. So if you're not... This was the way she spoke to people. And she yeah. did. And I mean, she did. You just see today how many people are still connected to her. So obviously the messages that she was getting out there were being received. And obviously her actions are a big part of yes. it. I mean, you know, it's not just because she looked a certain way, but that looking a certain way helped her to deliver the job in hand. And with an exhibition like this, obviously Diana... Has a, very, um, has a very special place mm -hmm. in the royal family, largely because of how she died and also because of you know, her, her separation and divorce from Charles was difficult and then William and Harry then losing their mother so young and she remains a very present part in their life. With an exhibition like this, do they see it or get involved or do you kind of have to run it past them and say, we're planning to do this, is well, this okay? Well, the or? thing is, we, we, as I said before, we're separate institutions, so we're an independent charity. We have, um, well... We're independent to do whatever we want. Of course, we want to be very respectful to them. They are living beings, right? They're yeah. not just an image or kind of a fantasy. They exist and they have feelings and they, f you know, they and understand. They just around the corner. And they live here with yeah. us, you know, like we share the same kind of building. So um, we want to be very respectful. And I mean, we're talking of us about a subject that it can be tricky sometimes, but at the same time, it can be wonderful. Yes. You know, talking about Diana, there's so many amazing things that she accomplished that the legacy is still carrying on by them. I mean, all the charities that she supported, her son supported as well. So, you know, we want to be tactful and we, we want to get the best out of it for her and for the public. You know, what's the point of creating controversy 
the newspapers can do that better than we can. You hey, know, hey, <laughs> <pay nice. laughs> some, some of them. Um, but you know what we want to do is actually talk about her work and her legacy and look at how the clothes help to do that. Um, so yes, we, we let them know when we were planning it, we were always very open because I think that's a good way to, to be, isn't it? It's just being open about everything that you do. But they weren't involved. So all the curation happened in-house. We curated this exhibition. We chose the dresses that we thought uh, helped us to tell the stories that we wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. So it's very much our exhibition. Mm -hmm. But yes, we, we came to them and they were incredibly generous at points in the exhibition. They actually lent us some of their personal dresses. Um, they're not in this phase of the exhibition right now, but at some point we had three dresses that came from their private um, collection. So obviously that means they... Yeah, it's a, it's a positive it. story. Yeah, it, it's positive. You know, if, if, we, if they're lending us something, it means mm. that they believe in what we're doing. Um, and we're very thankful for that, but actually we created this. Yeah, you know, so the, those dresses were here and then they've been returned to that collection. That, yes, it? because we, with all our loans, there's a limit of how long um, a dress can be on display for its safety, okay. because light and gravity, all this has an impact. So we, we try to keep dresses on display for a very short period, and then we are always rotating them. So Oh, wow. So you have to plan for multiple phases mm -hmm. of an exhibition. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The, when the exhibition opened, and the exhibition that you're seeing now, it's almost completely different. I mean, the stories are the same. You know, the, what we're talking about is the same, but the dresses have changed so oh, wow. much. Well, Interesting. The Travolta dress. Oh. Me too. And well, also, if people have been, if people came early in the exhibition, they've got time to just come back and well, see, right, more. Exactly. see phase two and see more. Um, and can we see one more room? One more, one more room. And then, and then we're done. A circular cabinet. Yeah. Uh, Talk circular about cabinet that. embellishment. We're back to evening wear. We've got some portraits as well, photographic portraits of yes. Diana on the walls. Three of them. So this room, as I said before, we like to pay little homages here and there. So we did one for the designers and we did one for the theater. Um, and now we're paying homage to an auction. And that is quite a weird thing to do, one may say. Uh, but actually this auction was such an important pivotal moment again. So we have moments in her life when there's drastic changes. The first one, of course, was getting engaged to the Prince of Wales. I mean, that will change anybody's life, you know, inside out. So you have that. And then she realized that she couldn't be a trendy princess. She had to be stylish. That's another pivotal moment. Then we have the separation and her style changes again. And now we come here and it's 1997. Um, she is a single, you know, she's not married to the Prince of Wales anymore and she's doing all this amazing charity work and she's very focused on that and, you know, raising her children. And she's still suffering from a chronic problem that most Londoners suffer, me included, lack of space. <laughs> <laughs> you can be a princess and you still, at some point in your life, you realize your wardrobe is too small, <laughs> right? This is a problem that I have to face every day. And sometimes I think, you know, getting dressed in the morning and I'm like, Diana had the same problem. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but yeah, so it gets to a point that she opens her wardrobe and realizes there's like some of the most amazing dresses ever made. You know, the craftsmanship is the best. They're so iconic. There's so much cultural value attached to them because of her. It's not just that they're expensive couture dresses. It's about the cultural phenomenon that is involved in them. And she's realized, I cannot just give them to a charity shop. There's too much currency in them to do that. So what happens is, as the story goes, Prince William actually said, Mom, why don't you sell all those dresses that you're never going to wear again? And the money goes to your charities. Duh! You know, like, <laughs> yes! Well done, William. Yes. I mean, that's how the story goes. But So she contacted Christie's in New York, and she says, I have selected myself selected 79 of some of my most iconic dresses and we're going to sell it and all the money will go to cancer and hiv charities everything 
Chris is just like, yes. cha ching, you know, like, yes, indeed we will. So it happens. And for me, it's a moment where she's really turning the pages in her life, you know, saying that was a chapter in my life. So when I was letting go a little Exactly. Bit, you know, I was, I was a princess and this is what I accomplished and this is what I did. I'm turning the page. This is going to be the next phase of my life. Unfortunately, we never got to see what the next phase was because the auction happened in July and in August we had yeah. the accident. So we never really got to see what the next chapter was except that we do through the work of her children. So the work that the boys are doing, or the Dukes are doing, I mean, I keep saying boys, I shouldn't. It's, <laughs> fine. it's fine, you come with us. We refer to them um, all the time. The, friends. The, the, the work that they're doing today is very much carrying on what she did. So basically, what we see in the next chapter is the work that they're doing. Yeah. And I find this so powerful. And when we first opened the exhibition, people would come here and they would leave crying because it is a very emotional way to finish an exhibition. You know, you're having this connection with this person for so long and all of a sudden here you are confronted with the idea that she, it was cut short in a way. Yeah. But actually, we change it ever so slightly. So when you leave, you see a little... Um, kind of footage of the work that they're doing now so you get a sense that yes it's continue on it's a different form but it's the same work it's interesting that she chose to auction it in america as well like she yeah. clearly understood mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. global she was and that actually oh, yes. over there oh, it, you know, there was a yeah. real opportunity to make probably the most money for her charities um is there a favorite what's your favorite absolute favorite piece that's here at the moment that Oh, it's so hard. They all have such good stories, you yeah. know, every single one of them. But um, I like I mean, this one. This dress. Yeah. If we're we come here. Well. So one, one last dress to finish us off. One, is, one oh, last one. Lots of sparkle. Kind of a, almost like an as, well, I don't know, almost Egyptian feel to yeah, it. Yeah, so. there's something about it. So it's very, 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 very fitted um, dress by Versace. And it's interesting because the dress is from 1991, but most people, they remember it because um, it was in the cover of Harper's Bazaar when they did a tribute to the princess after her death. So most people actually saw this dress in 97. And I cannot tell you when we first opened the exhibition how many people you know, comments we get saying, you got the date wrong, it was 97. <laughs> wow. And we're like, mm, no, it's 91. So this dress, she wore for a photo shoot at Harper's uh, in 1991, and it was shot by Patrick de Machelier. But that photo never got printed. Others in that editorial got, but this in particular didn't. So people didn't get to see it in the original. They only saw so after much later. Yes, so it's funny because... Yes, so many. But, I mean, it, it's so incredible to think of a dress like this. I don't know how comfortable it would have been with all those huge beads but everywhere. This Versace dress kind of sums up her style evolution for me. Yes. Because, as you say, as you walk through the exhibition, all you see is everything being paired back, paired back, paired back. Yes. Then she starts to bring in her kind of personal touches, mm -hmm. starts to play with fashion. Yeah. And this really says for me where she was with her style absolutely it's a very very confident dress i mean the the, the shape of it is very simple but then obviously you have all the embellishment yes. versace so iconic at that time exactly. i think there's just so many things going on for me in this yeah and I, one last comment about it is that versace is not a british designer no and this idea that british royal women can only wear british fashion is not necessarily true they tend to do it because they want to be patrons of the national fashion industry and there's value in that and this is something that Queen Victoria was doing you know 200 years ago um, well 150 years ago 200 years is when she was born uh, but anyways I diverse but you know that idea that you have to only wear British they do it because they want to there's no written rules saying once you become a royal you can <laughs> only <laughs> wear British it's not they do it because they want to but that doesn't mean that sometimes they cannot have some fun with some international designers and she did with Versace this is not the only one that you wore. No, and they became very good friends. Yes, absolutely. Mm. 
Thank you so much for showing us around today. People oh. have until is it the 19th to get down here? 17th. 17th. Yes. 17th. So get your skates on and come on down. Mm -hmm. And then presumably there's a t period of taking it down and plan it. Well, I would imagine yes. the next exhibition is already oh, planning. Yeah. What, what can people look forward to next? In yes. This so this year, so in 2017, we were, it was all about Diana, you know, think, remembering her and all her work. This year is the 20, no, 200th anniversary of Queen Victoria's birthday. So she was born here in Kensington Palace. Um, so it's all going to be Victoria this year. We'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> well, we might be back if, if you'll have us. Absolutely. We found it absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yes. Oh, Thank my you. pleasure. So these fabulous dresses. Um, I don't really want to go back to work now. I feel a bit emotional. Oh, I, I, really, I really understand that you, know, you get yeah. to the end and it kind of all hits you. Yeah, it mm. really does. But I hope you enjoy it. I and really enjoyed it. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Mm. So thank you very much for talking oh, us through thank it. Thank you for coming. And thank you very much to our listeners. And until next time.